Hi everyone, welcome to the Elements of Motion Graphics. In this series, we'll be narrowing our focus to the essentials of artistic composition and the rules of animation. Starting from the simplest geometric shapes, which we're going to call atoms, we'll be generating a few isotopes, small variations on the atoms, and many molecules, composed of clever compositions of the two. From there, we'll shift our focus into setting up the reaction by building up on the fundamentals of composition to create a pleasing image. Finally, we'll study reaction kinetics and set everything into motion with the important rules for animators. I figured that the chemical analogy fit this process well, so that's what we're going with. Additionally, this will set up a good foundation for future work, as composition is incredibly important in setting up an appealing render, while familiarity with the principles of animation will save you lots of time from struggling with animations that just don't work. After all, laying out simple motion graphics is a great way to focus on the composition and animation of a scene without being distracted by complex lighting or models. Alright, so let's get started. Alright, so we'll remove the default cube and we'll start by adding our atoms. So the basic elements we want to have here are a plane, which you can just create by adding a plane. You can turn on grid snapping by hitting that magnet icon at the bottom. And we can also have circles, so make sure to set the fill to triangle fan like I just did. Um, I'll show you why in a bit. And a couple of more, a couple more polygons. So the circle tool can be used to make any sort of regular polygon, but um, we'll start with an equilateral triangle, and we're also going to have a hexagon. You'll note that all of these have the triangle fill, um, not the n-gon fill. Uh, we can also add the pentagon, which can be useful for making a bullet shape. And if you want to add a star, the star is just uh, a decagon, I think it's called, with the alternating vertices scaled down towards the center. All right, so these are our primitive atoms. These are, well, the modeling here is not too complex, hopefully. So these are sort of the basic shapes that we can build off of to create isotopes, which uh, in chemistry are elements that have, or materials that have a different number of neutrons, so they vary in their physical properties, but not in their chemical ones. So, uh, this is just a couple of variations on the shapes that I've been able to think of, but I'm sure there's plenty more that you might be able to. And there are a couple of general themes of variation here. We can subtract uh, chunks of elements by subdividing it, uh, creating those uh, chevron shapes. We can also use the inset tool to create a, a variable fill, so we have sort of like a ring instead of a circle. Uh, again, you can see the subtraction with a semicircle or a quarter circle, and we just need to select all the faces, um, and we can remove those. Fairly straightforward. And there's just a ton of variation you can do here. If you want, you can also make some variations with different stroke thickness, uh, or this would be like sort of the thickness of the outline. And there's not too much to this process. And a lot of this will also be highly dependent on the sort of thing you're trying to create. But as you can see, these are a couple of different shapes that we can manipulate in order to create a lot of variation. And this variation will be pretty helpful in the future if we want to uh, use all of these shapes in order to make a, a well-balanced composition. So these are all just standard modeling operations, um, scaling, rotating, uh, and insetting. These are pretty straightforward. Um, if you're not familiar with these, I suggest you you check out some Blender beginner tutorials, because um, this is something you'd want to learn early on. But these are pretty much the only tools we'll be using. The modeling part of this is not 
intended to be particularly complex because the focus is on motion graphics um, and animation and composition, and I don't want to distract from that by overcomplicating the modeling process. So we have some primitives here, which is good and what we were looking for. All right, so there are a couple more primitives we might want to take a look at. Um, we can also select out arc sections by deleting portions of a ring. I suggest sort of a, a semicircle, a 90 degree arc, maybe a 60 degree arc, and a 270 degree arc. These are pretty useful if you want to have these segments. And you can see how flexible all of this is. Now you can also note that there are many ways of making the different shapes you see here. This bullet shape can also be uh, created by the similar way as the first chevron. Um, we can just loop cut the, the plane by control R in the middle, and then we just drag one vertex half of the length upwards. We can also reverse that to make um, a sort of ribbon tail shape, which might be useful in some cases. And it's just helpful to have this sort of variation and to keep in mind what you can do with it. You may want to, again, have uh, a lot of different variations on the, the stroke thickness while you make these objects. And really, this is just up to your own ingenuity to create um, a lot of interesting looking geometry. These are just some of the more basic ones that come to mind, but I'm sure there are plenty more that, that you could come up with. Okay, so now we have a couple of different shading uh, models we can use, conceptual models here. So what we can do is first we'll select one one object and we're going to give this, we're going to be doing a, a randomized color uh, model first. And the way we can do this and generally get random values in Blender is by using the object info and then connecting the random output from there. And then we can attach a color ramp to it. And you're not going to see anything because um, for one shape, uh, the color is going to be set. It's, this will not produce a gradient, uh, even though the color ramp might suggest that. Um, but a good way to think about this is that the segments on the color ramp are express the probabilities. So if you had 50% white and 50% black, there's a half chance that the object with that material would end up having that color. And now we can select everything, hit Control L, and then we can hit materials in order to give everything the same material. You don't want to do this one by one because that would take forever and there are tools to prevent you from doing that. Here's a second option for shading. Instead of having a bunch of colors, we can just have two. Uh, we'll have a primary color, which will be highly saturated, so that'll be this red color, and a secondary one, which will be a shadow color. So I'll set the background to a, dark, a darker shade of blue, and then I'm going to derive that secondary color by using the color picker and copying the background. I think I selected a grid line there. Let's try that again. All right, okay. So then we can just darken it slightly and we have a shadow. And this is another model of shading we might want to use. So here's the toolkit we've assembled so far and let's create some interesting molecules by composing them. First, we can make linear arrays. So the way we do this is we use the array modifier and we can have some simple relative offset. If something weird happens like this, it's because you haven't applied the rotation. So you can hit control A and apply the rotation and then the uh, relative offset will work correctly. Or you could always just use the constant offset. And generally shapes that are uh, directional, like arrow tipped, uh, tend to work well in arrays. Uh, Secondly, we have sort of complex abstract objects. So these, there isn't really much of a general way of doing this, and this is a bit of a catch-all for uh, anything that doesn't fit neatly into the array model. Um, so we can just compose a bunch of sections, or a bunch of different elements. But you'll note that you don't want them to stack on top of each other and directly intersect, because that is not going to render very well. So make sure they're offset slightly. Again, if you make a mistake there, it's not too big of a deal and it can be always corrected in the final 
uh, animation, but uh, we'll just have to wait till we get there. Okay, so here's a, a Triforce looking thing. There aren't... You could stretch this to a, a pretty infinite amount of complexity. Just logos and that sort of thing might fit in this uh, category. But this is just generally patterns that you you can create out of these primitive uh, elements. And these are... there's not really much of a, a process to make these. Just keep them roughly symmetrical, if that's what you're going for, and we'll leave it at that. And I'm just going to try to arrange these neatly so they can be used uh, more efficiently later on. Finally, we have our... well, we have two more classes. So uh, we can create these grid elements, which are 2D arrays, so we just need to add two arrays, uh, two array modifiers with a similar relative offset, and uh, in parallel, or sorry, perpendicular directions. And then we get these grid shapes. And you can generally use any primitive, although I suggest you do not use directional ones, like arrows. Uh, another thing we can do with this is we can shape these so the 2D arrays don't always end up as squares or rectangles. Uh, instead, we can use a Boolean modifier in order to uh, shape it to conform to whatever sort of shape we want. So here's an example of a shape. Uh, this is a square and we want to turn it into a, a circular grid. Uh, and the way we do that is by we can put a circle on top of it, make sure they're overlapping. Um, And if you have the bull tools add-on, or you've watched my other videos, you can try to use that. Otherwise, you can apply a boolean modifier and use the intersect function. Um, so you're not going to be able to see that correctly because you need to make sure the thing that you're intersecting with has volume. So make it into a cylinder that encloses the area that you want to cut out, and then you can hide that cylinder. Or you could just straight up apply the boolean modifier and then uh, delete the cylinder entirely. This viewport display will uh, make sure we don't see it while we're working, which can be helpful, and this can create some pretty interesting effects if we leave it on. So yeah, um, you can also do this with lines and have a, an array of lines, and then we can have sort of a zebra stripes pattern. Um, but yeah, that's all for grids. Finally, we have um, the nested elements. So these are just going to be elements inside other elements, fully enclosed or partially enclosed. Um, and we can do a lot of really interesting things with this. A bunch of concentric rings can look really nice uh, if you position them correctly. Just try to make sure everything's centered by using the, the grid. And this is one of the most common elements you'll sort of see. Just be careful not to make too, these things too dense. Um, and sometimes it'll look better if you keep a consistent thickness to the lines everywhere. So yeah, here are some sample uh, nested elements, although there are definitely plenty more that you could come up with. So that brings us to the end of the video, but here's a little bit of homework. Come up with a dozen more molecules, um, and maybe some isotopes too, to complement them if you can uh, spare the time. It's a good exercise to come up with these primitives and try to create something unique out of simple geometric shapes, and they'll definitely help to create a more unique final product. Now that we've created our toolkit of atoms, isotopes, and molecules, we can begin to work on composition and animation, which will take place in future episodes of this series. Alright, I'll catch you in a week. See you!